All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share and try to learn a little bit more of what it is the Bible is teaching, what it is that the Bible is saying, and my pleasure is to be able to share Matthew chapter 14, the second part. And we're going to look at chapter 14, verse 22 and onward, and we're going to see a couple of short stories there that will help us to be, I believe, inspired. And there's so much more to be able to share. I'm sure that any one of you, if you presented this chapter, the second part from verse 22 and onward, you could come up with all sorts of stories and illustrations and applications far beyond what we're going to do today. So yes, I'm going to go through it, but this doesn't cover everything. I'm positive. And so I'm looking forward to at least sharing these, these few thoughts that we have. So I'm going to go now to um, uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, and we're going to see what it is that the Bible is saying here. It says in verse 22, straightway, immediately, like right away, Jesus, he constrained his disciples to get into a ship. Now that was right after he fed the 5,000. Remember that was happening. This actually, this story picks up in John chapter 6 as well. There's other sections as well, but John 6 will help us with a little bit of information a little bit later. So straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and constraining, you know, I mean, like this was a command. He compelled them. He necessitated that they would go in there. He constrained them. So this was like a command from Jesus. You guys, hey, get in the ship and go on before me onto the other side, okay? And they're like, okay. So they get into the ship and it was while he sent away the multitudes. See, these people had been there for a long time. They really wanted to know more and, and Jesus had been able to show them. In fact, the, the multitude probably didn't want to go away because they had just seen Jesus turn a little lunch of five loaves and two small fishes into enough to feed a crowd of potentially 15,000 people. If every man had a wife and every man and wife had a child, then that's 15,000 because it's 5,000, not including women or children. Now, there's potential that there was a lot more women because, I mean, even if he did that today, if Jesus was around today and you counted the men, it's very likely, even in our churches today, there are more women than there are men. So, I mean, think about the church that you fellowship at. Is that true? You have a lot of men, but you have a lot more women. There's enough men to go around, you know, picking up the offering and these kind of things and doing the, some of the work in the church, the preaching, etc. But there's often a lot more women. And so if it's statistically the same in that day as it is today, then it's potential that there's 20,000 or more. Anyways, he fed that many people with five loaves and two small fishes. So the multitude didn't go, want to go away, but Jesus wanted this to happen. He constrained his disciples. Okay, guys, go over there. And uh, multitude, you're going to have to go. Thank you so much for being here. You're excused now. And watch this, because when he constrained them to go, they went to the other side, the disciples did, and he sent the multitudes away. But I want to show you something real quick. This is where they were, was in... Tiberius, okay? Tiberius is a place that's on the like center west side of the Sea of Galilee. And where they were going, we're going to read a little bit later, and you can learn this in the book of John chapter 6, is that he was in the uh, Tiberius, the Sea of Tiberius. And, you know, basically this, this is a, a lake, a sea. It's not really a sea, but they, it's traditionally called that. It has several different names, okay? Galilee is on one side, the Sea of Bethesda, the Sea of Gennesaret, the Sea of Capernaum, the Sea of Magdala, or the Sea of Tiberias. Depending on where you are, it's what it's called. But we know it by the various names, Tiberias, Gennesaret, Galilee, and those names specifically. So this is where they were, but they were going to Gennesaret. So they weren't going directly across this way, which by the way is eight miles. And neither were they going from up here down below, which would have been 13 miles. They were only going from here to here. But you know that the wind was contrary to them. So it's likely that they were blown out a little bit into the midst. I'm not sure before they came over. I don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But, you know, this sea right here is not even very deep. The sea itself is actually only 42 meters deep. It's about 140 feet it's not very deep. So I think it's really interesting how when you're looking at this sea, if you will, 
they're kind of on the left side and it's not very deep. Where they were going over, if you actually go online and you can see how deep it is, it, what uh, portion of the lake you're at, they were in about 25 or so meters if they went straight from Tiberias to Gennesaret. There was only 25 meters there, it wasn't very deep, but still that's a lot of water. And it is true even today because of the way it's set up in a the valley there that winds come up and there are some raging waves that go through that. I've never seen them and it might be interesting to see one time even uh, look it up to see what kind of videos they capture about that location and what kind of storms go through there. But anyways, this is what's going on. They just came from feeding the 5,000. Now they're there and they are looking forward to this time where Jesus is alone. He's sending his disciples away and the multitudes are away as well. Now, <clears throat> when he had sent the multitudes away, what did he do? He went up into a mountain apart to pray. Now, this is something he had done before, because like, I'm going to go to, let's see, Mark chapter 1, verse 35. In the morning, rising up a great while before the day, Jesus went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed, okay? So this was a big deal for Jesus, going out into the wilderness, going out into per perhaps a mountain like it says here. Well, he went apart to pray. Nobody was with him. He was by himself. And it says, when the even or evening was come, he was there alone. So imagine that time with just you and God, right? You've been there before somewhere, maybe by the side of the ocean or perhaps on a rock somewhere maybe you know in a in a very large field of just flowers or grass but you've got that time where you're just alone well jesus was used to that he had been there many times like that before and at this part this point jesus is alone he's there to pray he's with god and this is you know that special time for him well he actually stares that stays there for quite a time watch what the bible says when the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary, it says, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, the ship was in the midst of the sea, okay? Now, we could say that it was in the midst of the sea between Tiberias and Gennesaret, but I guess it does say, I had said before that it didn't. If, I guess if it was me, if I was to say, what does the Bible mean? I would think they're in the midst of the sea, okay? The deepest part. And that would be, let's see, seven and a half miles in, right? Or like, you know, six and a half miles in, and about four miles in this way. So they're quite a distance from the land. And, you know, as far as I can tell, I'm not afraid of a lot of things. I Just the other day, I was in a bus and we were, like I was one seat back from the window, okay? The only thing between me and the window, which you know what, those buses have the big windows. The only thing between me and the window was one, I guess, barrier that would be like what you would have in front of every seat. Okay, there was that barrier. It didn't have a seat in front of it, so you couldn't sit there. That's where the steps went down and you'd be able to get out and leave the bus at that point. So I was there. We were probably going about, I would think 40 miles an hour, not terribly fast. I'm not sure about kilometers per hour. You can do that math in your head because I never learned that stuff in school. I wasn't paying attention that day, I suppose. But what happens is we were going about 40 miles an hour, coming over a crest. And as we're going down this hill, there is an, an SUV that's coming the other direction. And it was off the road on our right side. It would, be, it would have been their left side because they were going toward us. And the person was looking over their shoulder to see if they could come into the traffic on the other side and go that direction. So we're coming down this way. They're coming this way. And when she finally turns her head to look and see like, okay, I'm clear there, she sees this bus coming at her. I can look at her because I'm right there in front of the bus, right? And so the bus driver, he starts to slow down a little bit and starts to pull to the right. Well, this person starts pulling our direction as well, thinking we would go the other direction while they went this direction and we'd pass by this way. Instead, the bus driver thought, I'm going to go this way while hopefully that person goes that way. 
Well, finally, the person, instead of turning toward us, turned the other direction and barely missed the bus. And I'll tell you, my heart wasn't beating. I wasn't scared. There was nothing in me at all that caused me to, like, you know, shake or, or whoa, you know, that kind of stuff. I said, wow, we're, that was really close, is what I said. And, you know, everybody else was kind of like thinking, you know, wow, this was, that was intense. Well, I don't have a lot of things that scare me. I just, I don't tend to be scared in a lot of ways. But one thing I don't like is being in water where I can't see the bottom. Okay, that's just a, that's just a real thing. I mean, if I have like a surfboard or a boogie board or something like that, and I'm on the waves, I can handle that. But if it's just me and I don't know what's below, below me, I mean, like I've seen Jaws, I know what's down there. I've put my foot in the wrong spot and had something squirm from underneath it. And it just freaks me out. Right? So I suppose if I was there on the ocean and there was this big storm and I was in the midst of the sea, four miles in, six miles down, and you know, nothing's around me except a lot of waves, I probably would have been freaked out too. I mean, these guys were. So <laughs> anyways, I'm just being real here. I don't know about if this is the way you are or not, but that's what it is for me. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. So tossed, let's see what that is. Pained, toiled, tormented, tossed or vexed, right? Tortured. The boat was in a pretty bad place. It was tossed with waves. Well, for the wind was contrary, that means going the wrong direction, it was against them. They, well, they weren't going with the wind, so it was easy to get to the west side, like over here. They were trying to go this direction, and the wind was probably coming down from this northwestern area, coming toward the southeast, right? And they were trying to get to the other side. Well, it says the wind was contrary to them. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into them walking on the sea. Now, what is the fourth watch? I'm sure we can find this in the Bible, and in fact, I know how, but I'm not going to find it now because it would take me a little time to search, but you can see that there's, there's the uh, even, the night, the, you know, I don't remember one, but then the morning, there's four watches. And what you do, if you look online, you can find that it's from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., that's the first watch, 9 to 12 is the second, 12 to 3 is the third, and 3 to 6 is the fourth watch. So right before the sun comes up. Well, now think about this for a minute, because Jesus was up in the mountain alone. The sun had just gone down. We don't know how long he was there before the sun went down, but he is there at least until about 2, maybe 2.30 in the morning. So he's been praying for a long time. I've tried that. I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes there's been situations where I've wanted to pray all night, and I, <laughs> I end up waking up and just thinking, oh Lord, I'm sorry, you know, I want to pray some more. And I just, you know, try to pray more. And then I wake up again and I pray more and I wake up again. And I, I physically don't have the ability to stay awake like that. I mean, it's hard for me even on a plane to stay awake for a whole hour while I'm just uh, sitting there on a plane. I generally pass out <laughs> within a few minutes. And so I, I'm not sure what it was like for Jesus, except that the urgency and the necessity that he had to be awake and the I suppose even a supernatural ability given by God at those times to stay awake for the necessity of what he had been preparing for. So anyways, he was praying for a good long time, and it was the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, walking on the sea, you know, to live, to deport oneself, to follow, to be occupied with, to walk about. I mean, this is to tread all around. He was literally walking on, not under not over, he was walking on the sea, which is water. I mean, that's like, you know, the sea, uh, that's what it literally is, and that's how it's translated. So, he's walking on the water. Now, I've never really seen anybody do that, but I do fully believe that Jesus did it. In fact, here's the way Jesus did it. It's Acts chapter 2, two verse 22. You men of Israel, so now P Peter is preaching here, he's talking to the church. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. So he would, you saw him, he was right among you. He was approved by miracles and wonders and signs, which, what does it say? God did by him in the midst of you. So you guys saw God do miracles by him, right in the midst of you all, as you yourselves also know. So even the Israelites knew that it was God that did the miracles. 
that's why they said in some of the Gospels, like, give glory to God. You know, they, they, it was important for them that they wouldn't give glory to anybody other than God. And so the Israelites, it says, you yourselves know this, that it was God that did those miracles by Jesus in the midst of you. And so the, the Israelites knew that miracles were done by God. And so here Jesus is walking on the water. This is not something that Jesus did in and of himself. This was not with almighty power that Jesus was able to walk on the water or calm the sea. In fact, I believe that all the miracles were done by the power of God through the ministration of holy angels. It doesn't say that in this Bible, neither does it say that in the writings of Sister White in this case, that uh, the angels were helping him. And if it does, please let me know because I've looked and I can't find it. But all the other miracles, all the miracles were done by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. So I have no reason to disbelieve that the angels weren't walking with Jesus, actually holding him up on top of the water. Now think about it for a minute. He would have been going with the waves. You know, he's walking up and down, if you will. He probably wasn't just walking and like going through the waves. He could have, but I'm, it says on the water. So he may have been climbing up and climbing down a little bit, you know, as he's going. And so what I can understand here is that this was a miracle. Jesus was walking on the sea, on the water. Now, was this something that was like uh, derived from Jesus himself? Was it something within him that enabled him to walk on the sea, on the water? Well, let's, let's continue by reading on and we'll see. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Now, I'm going to see this word troubled. They were agitated. They were stirred up. They were troubled. Their heart was like fluttering, if you will, not in a, a good way, but they were, they were literally troubled. They were saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Not only were they troubled, but they were fearful. But now I think it's interesting where it says, it is a spirit. I had somebody ask me the other day, like, was this spirit something that was like, I mean, did the disciples think that a spirit didn't or did have a body? Is that why he, they were saying this? That's a really good question. Something that we should understand. We should try to figure out what it was the disciples were saying because if they believed that the spirit can have a body um, and it's only a spirit and they see him like it's a visual manifestation of a spirit and not necessarily an angel like what, what were they thinking is what the question came to me uh, as and well it's actually not difficult to find there's only two times in the bible where this specific word spirit is used it's not pneuma it's not Ruach, because that would be the Old Testament, but Pneuma in the Greek is generally what you get um, the word spirit from, right? So I'm going to I'm gonna go and look here for a second, and I'm going to right-click on this word. I'm going to search for this key word, and I'm going to find that only two times, Matthew 14, which we're reading, and Mark 6, is it used. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. When they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed that it had been a spirit, and they cried out. So that's all the times that it uses that phrase, right? And so, what does it mean? I'm going to triple-click this word, and you're going to find that the word is phantasma. Oh, that's interesting. The word actually means specter, okay? I'm going to um, copy that word, and I'm going to look up the... the uh, how would you say the um, definition of it? Okay, I don't think I can make, oh, I can make that bigger, cool. So specter, it is something widely feared as a possible unpleasant or dangerous occurrence, the specter of a nuclear holocaust. Oh, you know what? This is different than the one I had read before, but this is the first definition. It's a ghost. This is an application of that word, like the specter of a nuclear holocaust. That's something that you'd be afraid of coming. But here it's a ghost. And I've looked at it in different ways, and uh, you can find that, um, in fact, maybe I can do it this way. And I'm going to put an ER there. Uh, there it goes. Wait, let's see. Uh, same thing. And so you'd have to look it up for yourself. But the word specter is actually a phantom. Okay, so like a ghost, something that you would think is more like a bodiless spirit. Okay, that's what me, we generally know as phantoms today. Well, so the disciples didn't use the word spirit when they said it is a spirit, like a pneuma. They didn't think it was a pneuma. They didn't think it was like the spirit of God or the spirit of man. They thought it was a phantom. And they were afraid because they're like, they'd never seen a phantom like that before, but they did have a word for it. And so 
that was a word that they only used in this situation. I think that's pretty interesting because when we're looking at the idea of somehow Christ, you know, like the Father giving his spirit to Christ by default because he was, you know, begotten that way, and then God sending forth the spirit of his Son into the world, does, does God send a phantasma, a specter? Does he send a phantom, some bodiless spirit to come in and fill us? Well, the answer is no. I, we've talked about this before, and so I'm not going to get into it much. But when you're looking at this word, phantasma, it's, I just think it's interesting. They actually used this word for what they thought was a ghost, a bodiless spirit of some sort, something they were afraid of. And, uh, you know, I think if Jesus came to me as a bodiless spirit, I would probably be afraid as well. That'd be kind of creepy. You know, like those things that you see in, or, and hear of in, in like, scary movies and um, like bad dreams, right? So what we have is this word phantasma. It is a phantom. And they cried out with fear. But instead of Jesus, you know, like showing himself like, hey, look. It's my hands and my feet. Well, no, he didn't do that. He did that like later in Luke chapter 24. But here it says straightway, Jesus spake unto them. So Jesus didn't say, no, 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 no. Look, it's a real body. He didn't say that. He spoke unto them. And I think that's really important that Jesus, when they're afraid, when they fear that they're, you know, actually being approached by some kind of phantom, he wants to encourage them by his words. He spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So don't be tempted with a fearful spirit, because, you know, the Bible teaches that God has not given us the spirit of fear. In fact, I'm going to look that one up. Uh, let's see. Spirit of fear. And it would be in the New Testament, and it is right there. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, there it is, of love and of a sound mind. So we don't have the spirit of fear. So don't have that spirit in your mind. Don't be afraid of a phantom. But what you should be is encouraged. Be of good cheer because it is me. It is I am the word, right? Be not afraid. So I really think that Jesus here gave us a good example. If we're ever afraid, if we ever come to the place like if I'm in water and I can't see the bottom, right? What should I do? Well, I should start thinking about the words of God. And even if I was molested by some creature below, then I would still be encouraged because, you know, the word of God is in my mind. So that's, that's definitely something we can learn from this section. Well, verse 28, Peter answered him, which is Jesus, and said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come out unto thee on the water. And, you know, that's a really powerful verse because Peter here, he didn't have divinity within him like Jesus walking on the sea or on the water. He was just a human being, right? A partaker of the divine nature, definitely, having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust. But still, Peter wasn't born of God. And so Peter here, he is born first of a human, and then he's born again, born of God. So, But he wasn't born of, a, of God first, like Jesus was, and then partaker of the flesh. And so Peter answering and saying, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. That's huge faith. Except, notice one word, if. <laughs> so Peter has courage, Peter has faith, but he's like, Lord, if it's you, if I can really trust your word, if you have spoken and I accept it as it is from you, if I can have faith in your word, if it's you, then bid me to come unto you on the water. Now, why would he say that? Because listen, if the master can do it, then the disciple can do it too. Why not? Like, okay, I'm here to learn from you. You're my master. You're my rabbi. If that's really you and you're doing something that you say, I can do all things that you have done, then make me to do it too. If you're the son of God. If you are who you say you are. Well, Jesus was who he said he was. He was the divine son of God and... He was like living a miracle that God was doing by his power, I believe, through the ministration of the angels, enabling him to walk on the water. And so how would Peter do it? Would Peter like look inside of his divine self to gather the somehow ability to walk on water? No, that's not how miracles work. 
what Peter was uh, enabled to do was to trust the word of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And in concert with that word, he was going to co-work with the heavenly agents, which would be the angels, and he would be able to walk on the water too. And I think that's incredible. So what happens here is Peter answered, he said, Lord, if it's you, if you are my rabbi and you're giving me an example of something that you've promised that I can do too, then bid me to come unto you on the water. And he said, come. He gave him another divine command. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. A good place to be, walking above the waters of this world, above the carnality that is in the sea, if the sea represents the people, he's above that. He has been lifted above the waters. He's able to walk over. He's able to overcome. And he's going to Jesus. That's a good place to be. In fact, he's listening to the words of God doing that. And so Peter's in a really good place right now. He actually has faith with a little tinge of doubt. But he has faith that what his rabbi has done, he is able to do as well. He's listening to the voice of God, and he is standing above the carnal waters of this world. So when he saw the wind boisterous, what is this word boisterous? It is stronger than man, valiant, powerful, boisterous, mighty, forcible. When he saw that he was about to go under the water without a surfboard or a boogie board like I would want to have, he was afraid. So he was afraid of the water like I would be, right? Peter was. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid because what was he going to do? He was beginning to sink and he didn't want to sink into that water. He felt like he was going to die. He was going to be consumed by the waves. He cried saying, Lord, save me. So he did believe it was Jesus. He first said, Lord, if it's you, and it was Jesus because Jesus had said, come, and by his word, Peter was able to co-work with the heavenly agencies and do the same thing that Jesus was doing, walking on the water. When he was afraid, he cried out to that same one that commanded him, Lord, save me. And what does it say? Immediately. Not waiting for a little bit, not saying, you know what, you got to learn a lesson right now because you didn't have faith in my word. But rather, immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith. You know, I have thought this through so many times, wondering how it was that God, oh well, rather Jesus, said this to Peter. And I would like to think that Jesus said it with a big smile. Like, O thou of little faith, you know, almost chuckling while he's grabbing this man who just walked on the water. I mean, if anybody got excited, it was Peter, right? And Peter would have been just like looking around so excited, like, boys, look, look, this is incredible. He's going to Jesus and all of a sudden he sees the water. He's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He starts falling. And I think Jesus was laughing at him. That's how I imagine it to be. If it's not that way, I will learn in heaven because we're probably going to be, see, be able to see all these things in um, HD, heavenly definition. Okay, it's going to be stretched across the sky. You can read that in the end of the great controversy. But... So what we have is, I think Jesus was laughing. Why did you doubt? Why didn't you believe that I could save you? I literally called you to come out onto the water. You were commanded to come. You did come. And then you looked away from me. You see, because, you know, Peter, he was, he saw the wind. If he was going to Jesus, it said that's where he was going. He was walking on the water. He was above the water. He like had total victory right here. But he turned his eyes away from Jesus and he saw the wind boisterous. That's his problem. He looked to the trouble around him. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in real trouble. And instead of looking to Jesus, you start looking at the trouble. Well, you start to sink at that point. It doesn't take very long. You start to sink immediately. Well, you know, if you're, if you're willing to cry out, even in your sinking, you've taken your eyes off Jesus. But if you switch again to turn your eyes back on Jesus and you say, Lord, save me, what does he do? Immediately he stretches forth his hand to save you. Okay? This is a really powerful story. This, this applies to anything in your life. Whether you've made a bad decision in relationships or in school, perhaps in business, 
Maybe you have said something contrary to your wife or your husband, your children, maybe your parents, somebody online, you've said something just, you know, off the cuff without realizing that you should have been a little more patient, a little more loving, a little more kind, a little more thoughtful. You should have had the Spirit of Christ. You're sinking. You feel awful. You don't want to have this in your heart right now. You don't know what to do. Lord, save me, right? Turn your eyes away from the situation and go back to Christ. And immediately he'll stretch your hand out. Now, sometimes you're going to have to deal with the consequences. Like, Peter got wet. <laughs> he was wet. And he was scared. And it was a real thing for him. But he didn't die. And I think that's really important here. Because Christ can save us from all sorts of things. We get our, I get myself into trouble all the time. And you do too. And so we, we're just, we're, we're human. We live. That's what we do. And so this teaching here that we can see that Peter went through and was able to uh, go through, I think is a real good lesson for us. So right here, Lord, save me. Remember those three words, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? And I'm sure, you know, if it was me and I was in the boat, I'd be laughing my head off like, Peter, are you serious? You know, there he goes, look at him, look at him, God, Christ saved him, praise the Lord. You know, I would have been just, I would have been screaming at the top of my lungs saying praise to our God. And that's just me. I don't know if you would have done that, but I sure would have. So it says in verse 32, when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Now, can you imagine? The disciples are just thunderstruck. Excuse the pun, there was a storm, but it, they were thunderstruck. And they had no idea what just happened. But you know, when Jesus had just said, come to Peter, and Peter was coming, he was obedient, but then he started to disobey because of his own focus, his own direction, and he started to go down. Well, Jesus had to pull him out and tell him that he didn't have faith. Well, then there's another portion in the Bible where, where Jesus was able to say to the wind and the waves, peace be still. And the winds and the waves obeyed him. You know, we're living in a world that nature will obey God if he has that in his plan. And in this case, it was God's plan to speak through his son, peace, be still, and the waves listened. There is nothing that is too difficult for God. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Nine. Zilch. I love saying all those words. That's like, you know, my, uh, <laughs> about all the German I know. But then when you, when you go into this understanding of what is happening here, where God is literally telling his son to speak to nature and it stops, we should wonder, like, why as humans should we not listen to when God speaks? When God speaks through his son, when God speaks through his word, when God speaks through his people, and you just know it's true, why do we disobey? Well, because we're carnal, and because we have chosen to sin, we like sin, and we don't really have the faith that we claim to have, right? Like Peter learned that this night. And so what we can do is try to understand that, you know, when, when Jesus speaks, and it's, it's at the command of his Father, we ought to listen like nature. The wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him. That's a good place to be. Like right here, they, they, they were solemn, but they probably had a smile on their face like, wow, this was incredible. And notice what they didn't say. I want to underscore this. They did not say, of a truth, thou art God. No, they didn't say that. They had no inkling. They had no direction. They had no like desire to say that. They said, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Like, they got it here. They knew who he was. And he wasn't God. He was the Son of God. And that must be understood. Of a truth, truthfully, verily I say unto you, you are the Son of God. Now, why is that important? Well, because Jesus doing the miracles, as it said in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, the Israelites knew that when the miracles were done, it was by the power of God. And so even Jesus walking on the water, Jesus calming the storm, Jesus making the, the, the boat stand still in the midst of this terrible storm and everybody starts worshiping, they didn't call him God. We must understand the disciples there in front of him knew there was a difference between God and the Son of God. And he, even in the midst of those miracles, was not called God. 
He was called the Son of God. That is extraordinarily important for us to understand how we interact with God. We too are sons of God, not by being begotten. We are first by creation and then by adoption. We're not begotten sons of God. There's only one of those. And that one begotten Son of God is Jesus. Before, of course, he was called the Son of God or Michael in the Old Testament. And so we can know that this man, Jesus Christ, is God's Son. Declared here by the power of his word. And they recognized him as such. And I think we should too. And that's why it's important to understand who Jesus Christ is. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, so they finally made it. So let's look at this map again, right? So let's see, they, they actually made it from uh, here, Tiberias, over to Capernaum. Right? So it says they were in the midst. So, you know, I, I correct myself. They did actually go into the midst. The wind was contrary to them, blowing them into the midst. And they were afraid. Jesus walked on water. Probably, I don't know where he, where he was, somewhere here, but he walked probably, let's say, about four miles on the water, three and a half miles, something like that. And <laughs> that, you know, that's awesome. I think that's amazing. You could be in the midst of a very difficult storm where you can't get out. You're going to die if you try to get out. You're going to destroy yourself. You're not going to swim four miles that way in this storm. You're not going to swim six miles that way in a storm, or six miles, six and a half miles that way, you're going to die. And But if you're in the midst of that storm, Jesus will walk to you. He will get you in the midst of that storm. This is a powerful story. And so it says there in verse 34, when they were gone over, they finally made it. They came into the land of Gennesaret. Now I want to show you something real quick. In John chapter 6, they started in Tiberias. This is the same story where he fed the great multitude with six, five loaves and two fishes. But I want to show you something here. It says that the lad was there, make the men sit down. Jesus took the loaves, they gathered the fragments, they gathered 12 baskets. And then it says they were rowing 25 or 30 furlongs. You can do that math. And it's about three and a half or so miles. Let's see, there it is. Then... When they willingly received him into the ship, it says, immediately, the ship was at the land, whether they went. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I've never had that really happen to me. I guess I have. I can't say that. I won't tell the story now, but there have been times where, okay, I'll tell you the story. I was very drunk and I was driving. I was a teenager. And I, I remember li little bits of this, this um, activity of driving under the influence. I had done it a lot. I don't encourage it to be done. I was spared by God and the prayers of my mother, I know. But I remember little bits of this drive, and I was swerving really bad. I was going like in and out of the two lanes that were up this mountain road that had cliffs on one side. and car. I remember cars going by periodically, but I remember going really fast, and I was heading right toward a, cl uh, a cliff that was, well, I, yeah, I guess a wall, like a cliff, but not down. It was a cliff going up. I was heading right at it and I remember like my eyes opening like oh no I'm gonna hit this thing and the next thing I knew I was in the middle of the road and I was still driving and I don't know how that worked except that God sent an angel to straighten that car out and get me going the wrong or the other direction but so it's happened and, and but I can't remember anything else like where I've been one place and then I'm at another all of a sudden like wait a minute how'd that happen but these disciples were in the boat. They saw the wind, according to Matthew, immediately cease. That's what it said, immediately. And then all of a sudden, immediately, they're at the shore. And I don't know, but if I was one of the disciples, I'd probably be looking at the other guys around me like, I mean, <laughs> what just happened? That's what I'd be asking. Well, it doesn't say what happened. It just simply says that they were on the, you know, the land immediately. Well, when they had gone over, it doesn't say that in Matthew here, but it does say it in John. They came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him. Now, how did the men of that place had knowledge of him? How, how did that happen? They sent out into all that country round about. There was like a, a, how would you say that? An advertisement, an advertising campaign. There you go. They sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. Now, why would they do this? Well, the men of that place, they had knowledge of him. 
And then they started doing like evangelism. Hey guys, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. They're out with this, uh, you know, they put it on Facebook and they were sending out emails and text messages and all that stuff. They were, they were just going wild with this idea that Jesus had come into the land, right? And they brought unto him all that were diseased. Now, why would they do this? Why? Well, it tells right here, actually, in verse 36, if you know what happens. They besought him that. Here's what they besought him for. They besought him that. This is why. Okay? They besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. <laughs> now, why would they do that? Why would they get everybody together? They would have this advertising campaign going on to bring people to him that were diseased. Why? Well, because remember, the uh, hem of his garment had come up once before. I'm going to go ahead and search this phrase. It only happens twice, and it was in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. We're in Matthew 14, verse 36. Well, there was a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years. She came behind him and touched what? The hem of his garment. And what happened to this woman? She was made whole. The blood stopped, right? And so when we look at this story where these men are sending out this information that, hey, Jesus is coming. They sent flyers everywhere. They brought these people unto him that were diseased because they learned of that woman, that woman that had touched the hem of his garment, that woman who was healed, and she went and told everybody she could, I'm whole, I'm pure, I'm clean, I don't have this, this issue of blood that made me impure, unclean, all those 12 years of my life, I'm now a new person. I can go get a job. I can take care of my family. I can go into the sanctuary now. I can, I can be in the holy place because I'm not unclean anymore. This woman had told everybody, and everybody was so excited. They knew that this woman had been healed. They knew where she was. They knew what she looked like. And now she's not dirty anymore. She's not impure. She's not unclean, like ceremonially. And so what happens is, Everybody's getting this word that if you just touch the hem of his garment, like that woman do, did, you'll be made whole. Now, we talked about the hem of his garment before, but we're going to go ahead and look at it again because I think it's important to understand. What does this mean, the hem of his garment? Well, let's go to, let's see, Numbers chapter 15, and I'm going to say 37. There it is. The Lord spake unto Moses. So this is God speaking. He speaks to Moses. By the way, he spoke to him very often through the ministration of holy angels. And in fact, um, no, I'm not going to say that. Verse 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments. Okay, the New Testament says hem of the garment, but this is the border of their garment. Throughout all their generations. So this is what they're supposed to do. And that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Now, they were supposed to have a ribbon of blue on the borders of their garments. Now why? What does this mean? It shall be unto you for, as a, for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. So they're supposed to remember the commandments and do them because of this blue fringe. That, here's why, that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to go a whoring. Well, see, Jesus, he had ribbon of blue on his garment, okay? And it represented the remembrance that Jesus had of the commandments of the Lord and the fact that he was doing them. And Jesus never sought after his own heart. In fact, Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. He never sought after his own eyes. When that woman caught in adultery who was naked was thrown before him, he looked down and he started writing in the sand. He didn't look her over. He started writing in the sand. And after which you used to go whoring, Jesus never went after another spirit. He never committed fornication with another. He was faithful to his father. That you may remember and do all the commandments and be holy unto your God. And that's what Jesus was. Jesus was holy unto his God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. God did bring Jesus out of the land of Egypt 
It was through the ministration of Joseph and Mary. And he was to be Christ's God. I am the Lord your God. This is spoken to Jesus just as much as he was spoken to any other Israelite. And so Jesus here is being surrounded with those that were diseased to be able to, so that these diseased people would be able to touch the hem of his garment. To be made whole, perfectly whole. Not just partly whole. And so what's happening here is these people have faith in the fact that Jesus had true, perfect, pure, and 100% righteousness. And when they put their faith in that righteousness, they were made perfectly whole. This is a visual illustration, an actual hands-on tangible illustration of justification by faith. You can't heal yourself. Yes, I see that. <laughs> You can't heal yourself, but you can trust in the perfect purity of Christ Jesus our Lord. And you can partake of His righteousness. It's what He does for us. What He did 2,000 years ago. He was perfect. He was pure. Unadulterous. He never a single time, never a single time listened to the voice of the enemy. He was 100% perfect and pure, holy, just, and good. And he wants us to be too. But how? Well, you can have faith in his righteousness. You can touch the hem of his garment. You don't have a garment of blue that's perfect and pure around you, friends. No, no, no. Not me, not you, nobody. But he did. And we can reach out and touch that. And that's how we're getting into the kingdom of heaven. If we're judged... We won't be judged by our righteousness, but by the faith of Jesus. His faith, not our faith. Our faith in Jesus isn't going to save us. His faith is going to save us. So we're saved by the faith of Jesus. And that's what this border of blue represents. This is the end of the chapter. I think it, it ends on a climax. This Jesus, who was able to, by his word, because he was speaking the words of the Father, able to command the wind and the waves to cease able by the power of God to bring them to the shore instead of being in the midst of their trials immediately, as it said there in John, and the ability to command the disciples as a rabbi to be able to bring them to the, through the same experience that he had. He was walking on the water, my friends, and so was Peter, you see. So it's an amazing experience to go through this section of the Bible and to realize that we too can walk on the water. We too can rise above the populous, sinful people around us. And we can do what Jesus did, all of it. And we can perform those miracles that Jesus did because he didn't even do it in his own divine power. He did it through the power of God, through the ministration of holy angels. And if there's a miracle that God needs you to do for him, he's going to do it by the power of God through the ministration of holy angels. And believe you me, it won't be that we'll take the credit. Absolutely not. It's not we that did it. We don't have that much faith or that much holiness whereby God says, okay, now you can work a miracle for me. No, sometimes, I mean all the time, we've got to just recognize we don't have that holiness except that we have faith in His Son. We're reaching out and grabbing the garment, the borders of His garment, and as a result, we're having faith in Him. This is the kind of faith that we must have, and this is the kind of faith that it is, in our experience, with Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not somebody else in you, the hope of glory. And he doesn't, like, tangibly come into you. He's not a phantom that climbs in somebody. No, it's his spirit, his mind, his will, his life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. By the way, the way that Peter was able to walk on the water was by listening to the spirit and life, which were the words of Christ. The words that I speak unto you, Peter, come. He did. He listened to the words. And it was by those words that he was able to have those miracles performed in his own life. And I think we can too. So I'm just rejoicing that we have the opportunity to read together and understand a little bit more. As I said, I'm sure that you guys come up with something that I didn't share today. But uh, maybe we can hear that in the comments in just a few seconds. But I want to commit myself to the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our Father as well. 
and I want to surrender to him my entire life, just as much as his son did. And I can't do that without his help. It's got to be Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's got to be Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I want to pray for that end. I want to ask God to help me right now have that experience and to be able to know that he, he that begun a good work in me is not going to stop. He's going to perform it and, and complete it until the day of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity to learn what we have today about how we too can walk on the water. We can walk above the circumstances around us. We don't have to be afraid of the billows and the waves of our lives. We can literally walk as your son did because we can listen to his words of command because those are your words and it's by your power that we're able to do this. Your spirit that was in your son has been sent by you through your son. It's the spirit of your son into our hearts. And we know that we can do exactly what your son did because it's not us. It's the, your power through the ministration of your holy angels. And we pray that you would help us to recognize that when those miracles occur, we can just praise you for using us as one of your agents as you've used your holy angels. And so, Father, help us to reach out and grasp that hem, that blue border, that hem of the garment, so that we too can be made perfectly whole in our spirit, in our life, in our, in our futures. We can live with Christ in us, the Spirit of Christ in us, which is the hope of our glory, which will be ultimately your glory. We're all going to bow to the, bow our knees to your Son, which will be to the glory of you, our Father. So bring us to that end, you which have begun a good work in us. You've said you will perform it and complete it until the day of your Son, Jesus Christ. Please make this happen in our lives, and we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could just talk um, about Peter at the moment. Sure, Daniel. please, please um, do. I think, I think a lot of us tend to crucify Peter as um, wearing his heart on his sleeve. <laughs> Well, I tell you, I, I can relate to that bloke <laughs> unbelievably. <laughs> I reckon a lot of Peter in me. I reckon a lot of Peter should be in everyone. Yeah. But I, I, I uh, tend to like Peter a lot because he spontaneously does it, you know, yes, without thinking. And I know he gets himself into a lot of trouble, but, oh, <laughs> I love that bloke. Hey, man. <laughs> I reckon he's a top bloke. You know, I, I did see a, a lot of him. I, I did see a, a lot of him in me. Amen. Yeah, right. I did a series on all the disciples individually years back as a pastor doing th through the uh, midweek meeting. And going through the yeah. life of Peter was so fun. It really was. Yeah. Even when he even when he denied Christ, I, I felt really bad for him because he had no intentions. No intentions. But in the same aspect of, you know, seeing a bit of fear and while they're in the boat, as soon as he saw the persecution come, he thought, oh, I'm out of here. No way to do that but he was genuine I actually see a lot of genuineness in Peter and uh, I love that man he's going to be there I'm going to meet him amen amen you know, right <laughs> that means I'm going to be there anyone else going to be there amen I'm going to be there by God's grace yes sir we'll give we'll give Jesus a good high five eh? <laughs> besides, besides putting our crowns at his feet I'll amen high five. Yeah, amen yeah. right Nelush would you like to say something yes yes I've got to um, it, it's just an amazing story, one following uh, the other, like uh, what happened on the sea, it, it follows straight away the miracle on the land with the food. And uh, I followed your, not your instructions, but uh, Jesus' instructions last time. I went through all the other, like Mark, uh, Luke, John, whatever they said about the same stories. And I would like you to put on the screen uh, Mark 6, verse 52, because there is a very strong connection between these two stories. And I never thought that it's, um, I never thought that way. And um, uh, it looks like whatever happened on the water there with uh, the disciples, they were amazed and they were big trouble. Um, it has a reason for that. And I would like you to read uh, verse 52 and make the connections between those uh, stories. Okay. Let me go back one verse here. When they went up unto them into the ship, the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, 
For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's that's amazing how they would uh, <laughs> they would be unable to remember just what had happened. I guess the day before, right? So that was the connection because they couldn't remember straight away, or because they couldn't understand what happened on the land there. I was just wondering. Why the heart was like that when they witnessed such a, a miracle day? Well, <clears throat> I think they're just, they were having such a hard time believing. You know, they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They, they wondered like, I mean, because Jesus, remember when they said, Jesus had said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, remember that? And the it, disciples were like, oh no, they, we, we don't have any bread. And Jesus was like, wait a minute, guys, don't you remember what had happened when I fed all those people? They're, they're forgetting the things that happened yesterday. Like, you know, I think this is a good application to the, to the sentence we know very well. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget how God has led us in the past and our past teachings. They had forgotten how God had led them in the past, and it looked to me like it's a hardened heart, right? Yeah, yeah I like the idea now. Okay. Because I think, I think they also you got to remember up until this point too they were really squabbling about who was number one, who was going to be next to Christ. Um, right. You know, had, had, um, they also believed that he, their their king was being set up here on earth. There was a complete struggle, and and I guess we're all guilty of that sort of thing too. If we're not focused on on the bigger picture of the second coming, we can get caught up with all the so-called things that are going on in this world and forget about where we're really destined to go. And I, I think the disciples were doing the same thing. Right. Uh, Charlie has his hand up. Yeah. Uh, just uh, looking at uh, the accounts in John, John chapter 6, actually, it's giving us a better uh, understanding about what happened after the miracles of the blows. Because in 6.15, John 6.15, it says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. So that's why uh, he had to dismiss uh, the multitudes and to tell the disciples to cross over to the other side to sort of like um, break their plan to make him a king. And I, I guess that's why um, it says that their heart will harden. Mm. It's not that they forgot the miracle, uh, but they just want uh, to make Jesus a king. Uh. No, that's true. That's true. That's a really good point that they were wanting to make him a king and he, and he was, uh, that wasn't his plan or purpose, right? Mm.